chapter sixteen of the forbidden way by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva old dangers camilla had known for some time that she could not forget she sought excitements eagerly because they softened the sting of memory and the childish delights of the afternoon with the Havilands, while they made the grim shadow less tangible could not drive it away when the idle chatter of small talk was missing jeff loomed large at the cove she went at once to her room but instead of dressing she threw herself on the bed and followed the pretty tracery of the wallpaper beside her her eyes only conjured mental pictures of the days in mesa city before cortland bent had come the long rides with jeff up the mountain trail when she first began to learn what manner of man he was and what manner of things he must one day accomplish she seemed to realize now that even in those early days jeff wray had stood as a type of the kind of manhood that since the beginning of time has made history for the world with all his faults his vulgar self-appreciation and his distorted ethics there was nothing petty or mean about him he was generous had always been generous to a fault and there was many a poor devil of a gambler or a drunkard even in those days who had called his name blessed he hadn't had much to give but when he made a stake there were many who shared it with him since he had been married his benefactions had been numberless he never forgot his old friends and remembering old deeds of kindness to himself had sought them out a broken sheep herder back on the range a barber in pueblo who was paralyzed a cowboy in arizona with heart disease a freight brakeman of the d and w who had lost a leg and given them money when he couldn't find work that they could do she remembered what people in the west still said that jeff had never had a friend who wasn't still his friend she had often reviled herself because her judgment of all men was governed by the external marks of gentility which had been so dear to her heart the kind of gentility which cortland bent had brought into mesa city gentility was still dear to her heart but there was a growing appreciation in her mind of something bigger in life than mere forms of polite intercourse jack perrault who was painting her portrait billy haviland who sent her roses douglas warrington who rode with her in the park cortland bent all these men had good manners as their birthright what was it they lacked culture had carved them all with finer implements on the same formula but what they had gained in delicacy they had lost in force jeff might have been done by rodin the others by carrière beleuse it made her furious that in spite of herself she still thought of jeff she got up and went to the mirror there were little tell-tale wrinkles about her eyes soft shadows under her cheekbones which had not been there when she came to new york it was worry that was telling on her she had never yet been able to bring herself to the point of believing that all was over between jeff and herself had she really believed that he was willing to live his future without her she could not have consented even for so long as this to play the empty part he had assigned her it was his money she was spending not her own his money which provided all the luxuries about her the rich apartment in new york the motor-car carte blanche at sherry's extravagances she was obliged to acknowledge which for the present he did not share true she was following implicitly his directions in keeping his memory green in the social set to which he aspired and she had done her part well 
but the burden of her indebtedness to him was not decreased by this obedience and she felt that she could not for long accept the conditions he had imposed such a life must soon be intolerable intolerable to them both it was intolerable now she could not bear the thought of his brutality the cruelty of his silence the pitiless money which he threw at her every week as one would throw a bone to a dog he was carrying matters with a high hand counting on her love of luxury and the delights of gratified social ambition to hold her in obedience he had planned well but the end of it all was near it was her pride that revolted that jeff could have thought her capable of the unutterable things he thought of her the pitiful tatters of her pride which were slowly being dragged from her by the tongue of gossip mrs rumson had warned her and mrs cheyne made free use of her name with courts the world was conspiring to throw her into cortland's arms she would not admit that the fault was her own it was jeff's it had always been jeff's she had given him every chance to redeem her but he had tossed her aside for another now she had reached a point when she didn't care whether he redeemed her or not she felt herself drifting drifting she didn't know where and didn't seem to care where it was affection she craved love that she loved and cortland was an expression of it he had always been patient even when she had treated him unkindly a whispered word to cortland her musing stopped abruptly what did cortland mean by avoiding her and why was he leaving new york there was a tiny pucker at her brows while she gave the finishing touches to her toilet but when she went down to dinner her cheeks glowed with ripe color and her eyes were shot with tiny sparkling fires auction bridge followed dinner in the cutting court and the baroness were out of it and when court and the baroness cut in camilla and perrault cut out fate conspired and it was not until late in the evening that cortland and camilla found themselves alone in the deserted library at the far end of the wing camilla sank back into the silk cushions of the big davenport wearily i played well to-night she said i believe even billy is pleased with me i did have luck though shameful luck she stretched her arms above her head sighing luxuriously oh life is sweet after all cortland watched her is it he asked quietly don't you think so court there's not much sweetness left for me in anything i've got to go away from you camilla so you said and then airily good-bye he closed his eyes a moment i want you to know what it means to me then why do it i-i've thought it all out it's the best thing i can do for you for myself i ought to be the judge of that his dark eyes sought her face for a meaning it's curious you didn't consult me she went on i hope i know what's best for myself you mean that you don't care my presence is unimportant my absence will be even less important i do care she insisted what's the use of my telling you i'll be very unhappy without you he shook his head and smiled oh i know you'll miss me as you would your afternoon tea if it was denied you but you'll do without it i'm quite fond of afternoon tea court and then more seriously are you really resolved yes he muttered resolved desperately resolved she threw herself away from him against the opposite end of the couch facing him and folded her arms her lips closed in a hard line very well then she said cruelly go it seemed as if he hadn't heard her for he leaned forward his head in his hands and went on in a voice without expression i've felt for some time that i've been doing you a wrong people are talking about us 
coupling your name with mine unpleasantly heaven knows what lies they're telling of course you don't hear and i don't but i know they're talking how do you know my father oh we quarrelled but the poison left its sting camilla laughed nervously the laughter of a woman of the world it grated on him strangely don't you suppose i know she said i'm not a baby and now that you've ruined my reputation you're going to leave me that's unkind of you oh don't worry she laughed again i'll get along there are others i suppose he straightened and turned toward her sternly you mustn't talk like that he said you're lying i know your heart it's clean as snow because you haven't soiled it she clasped her hands over her knees and leaned toward him with wicked coquetry really court you're a sweet boy but you lack imagination you know you're not the only man in the world a woman in my position has much to gain little to lose i'm a derelict a ship without a captain he interrupted her by taking her in his arms and putting his fingers over her lips stop he whispered i'll not listen to you i mean it i've learned something in your world i thought life was a sacrament i find it's only a game she struggled away from him and went to the fireplace but he rose and stood beside her you're lying camilla he repeated lying to me oh i know i've been a fool a vicious a selfish fool i've let them talk because i couldn't bear to be without you because i thought that some day you'd learn what a love like mine meant and i wanted you wanted you don't you want me still court she asked archly he put his elbows on the mantel and gazed into the flames but would not reply and the smile faded from her lips before the dignity of his silence i've thought it all out camilla i'm going away on business for my father and i don't expect to come back i thought i could go without seeing you again just send you a note to say good-bye it was easier for me that way i thought i had won out until i saw you to-day but now it's harder than ever he looked up as he thought she might misconstrue his meaning oh i'm not afraid to leave on your account our set may make you a little careless a little cynical but you've got too much pride to lose your grip and you'll never be anything else but what you are he gazed into the fire again and went on in the same impersonal tone as if he had forgotten her existence i'll always love you camilla i love you more than i ever did only it's different somehow it used to be a madness an obsession your lips your eyes your soft fingers the warm elusive tints of your skin the petals of the bud i would have taken them because of their beauty crushed out if i could the soul that lived inside as one crushes a shrub to make its sweetness sweeter he sighed deeply and went on i told you i loved you then back there in mesa city but i lied to you camilla it wasn't love love is calmer deeper almost judicial more mental than physical even i'm going away from you because i love you more than i love myself oh you never loved me she stammered you couldn't speak coldly like this if you did he raised his eyes calmly but made no reply love judicial she went on scornfully what do you know of love love is a storm in the heart a battle a torrent it has no mind for anything but itself love is ruthless self-seeking you make it hard for me he said with an effort at calmness you know i i need you and yet you'd leave me at a word i'm going because it's best to go he said hoarsely you're going because you don't care what happens to me he flashed around unable to endure more and caught her in his arms do i look like a man who doesn't care do i he whispered if you only hadn't said that if you only hadn't said that 
now that she had won she was ready to end the battle and drew timidly away but with court the battle had just begun and though she struggled to prevent it he kissed her as he had never done before her resistance and the lips she denied him the suppleness of her strong young body the perfume of her hair brought back the spell of midsummer madness which had first enchained him you've got to listen to me now camilla i don't care what happens to my promises to you or to anyone else i'm mad in love for you i'll take the soul of you it was mine by every right before it was his i'll go away from here but you'll go with me somewhere where we can start again in that brief moment in his arms there came a startling revelation to camilla court's touch his kisses transformed him into a man she did not know oh court let me go she whispered away from all this where the idle prattle of the world won't matter he went on wildly you have no right to stay on here using the money he sends you my money money he stole from me he has thrown you over dropped you like a faded leaf you're clinging to a rotten tree camilla he'll fall he's going to fall soon you'll be buried with him and nothing between you and death but his neglect and brutality in his arms camilla was sobbing hysterically the excitement with which she had fed her heart for the last few months had suddenly stretched her nerves to too great a tension she had been mad cruel to tantalize him and she had not realized what her intolerance meant for them both until it was too late he misunderstood the meaning of those tears and petted her as if she had been a child don't camilla there's nothing to fear i'll be so tender to you so kind that you'll wonder you could ever have thought of being happy before look up at me dear kiss me you never have camilla kiss me and tell me you'll go with me anywhere but as he tried to lift her head she put up her hands and with an effort repulsed broke away from him and fell on the couch in a passion of tears she had not meant this not this it wasn't in her to love any one in the process of mental readjustment following her husband's desertion of her she had learned to think of court in a different way it seemed as though the tragedy of her married life had dwarfed every other relation minimized every emotion that remained to her courtland bent was the lesser shadow within the greater shadow a dimmer figure blurred in the bulk a part of the tragedy but not the tragedy itself for a time he had seemed to understand and of late had played the part of guide philosopher and friend if not ungrudgingly at least patiently without those boyish outbursts of petulance and temper in which he had been so difficult to manage she cared for him deeply and lately he had been so considerate and so gentle that she had almost been ready to believe that the kind of devotion he gave her was the only thing in life worth while he had learned to pass over the many opportunities she offered him to take advantage of her isolation and she was thankful that at last their relation had found a happy path of communion free from danger or misunderstanding while other people amused and distracted her court had been her real refuge his devotion the rock to which she tied but this she realized that what had gone before was only the calm before the storm and she had brought it all on herself he watched her anxiously waiting for the storm to pass and at last came near and put his arms around her again no not that she said brokenly it wasn't that i wanted court you don't understand i needed you but not that way he straightened slowly as her meaning came to him you were only fooling only playing with me i might have known no i wasn't playing with you i couldn't bear to lose you but she stammered resolutely now i must 
you've got to go i don't know what has happened to me i haven't any heart i think no heart or soul he had turned away from her his gaze on the dying log why couldn't you have let me go without this he groaned it would have been easier for both of us she sat up slowly still struggling to suppress the nervous paroxysms which shook her shoulders forgive me court you you'll get along best without me i've only brought you suffering i'm a bird of ill omen which turns on the hand that feeds it i was was thinking only of myself i wish i could make you happy you deserve it court but i can't she finished miserably i can't he did not move it almost seemed as though he had not heard her his voice came to her at last as though from a distance i know he groaned god help you you love him she started up as though in dismay and then leaning forward buried her face in her hands in silent acquiescence when she looked up a moment later he was gone End of chapter 16